Uh, I also want to thank the organizers that they invited me to speak here. Do you hear me? <coughs> okay, I want today talk about data-driven analysis of spatiotemporal interaction. Um, my talk will be structured in an introduction in some uh, results and correlation analysis and how to approach this, then how to approach massively parallel data, and then I will discuss. So as probably everybody here, I'm interested in how does the brain compute um, and in particular, I'm interested in the cortex, which um, is uh, computing in relation to higher brain functions. And this is an interesting piece of brain because it's, uh, it has an extremely high density of neurons. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, there is an extremely strong convergence and divergence on each neuron and from each neuron. So one neuron is getting about 10 to 20,000 synapses. So we are dealing here with a highly interconnected network. And I guess uh, I'm right with the assumption that neurons do not act in isolation. But what do they then? Yeah. So um, there must be some working hypothesis. And I'm actually going back to Donald Tapp who had the hypothesis formulated that cell assemblies, meaning groups of neurons, <clears throat> act as building blocks of information processing. So um, how could we imagine this? So um, this is basic, I would say this is processing by an interaction of neurons. And um, that, uh, and a signature would be that assembly members would exhibit coordinated activity. So one uh, way of thinking of this would be if you had recorded uh, a number of neurons simultaneously, that if a certain assembly is active, that the neurons being part of this assembly would be synchronously active. If another assembly would be requested due to another behavior, another set of neurons, which are members of another assembly, would be synchronously active. And you could even have this that uh, individual neuron is participating in different assemblies at different instances in time. Now, <clears throat> the goal I see for myself is to detect and analyze such processes, so actually we don't have colored spikes, and to identify exp expressions of assembly activity. And in particular, this, um, to relate this to the dynamics <clears throat> of stimuli and behavior. Imagine in particular in a situation where you do eye movements, as nicely shown by Harald also this morning, you have, um, you have very short saccades and fixations in which in total last for about 200 to 300 milliseconds. Within this short period of time, you have to compute whatever is coming in and decide about the next eye movement. So it's a highly dynamic um, process and um, I would like to detect this. And in addition, we want to identify temporal and spatial scales of assembly activity. That's the goal. Now, how did I approach this about 15 years or so ago? <coughs> I started out with uh, developing an analysis method, which we call unitary event analysis. And this works in principle like this. If you record neurons in parallel, and you represent the simultaneous spiking activities as, as parallel 0, 1 sequences by appropriate binning, let's say 1 millisecond bins. Then you end up with zeros and 1s and 1 indicating spikes. And now you can do, do a lot of statistics on this. One, uh, the first you would do is typically deriving the firing probabilities of the individual neurons. Yeah? by a simple estimate, getting the number of spikes divided by the number of possibilities. It's a rough estimate. And in addition, you can also look what the neurons do simultaneously together. Yeah? So you can detect and count individual synchronous patterns across the neurons. However, detecting is not, the, if you just detect, you are not done. So uh, what you should do in addition 
is to calculate, so to say, is this going beyond what you would expect by chance, what you would get by the firing rates of the neurons. So we can also calculate the expected number of coincidences, assuming statistical independence, using the firing prob based on the firing probabilities, and also derive um, significance of empirical pattern counts based on, based on coincidence distribution. I will come back to this. You can also do this in a parametric fashion, but also do this um, using uh, surrogate methods. So now, if an empirical count exceeds significantly your expectation, we say we found unitary events, excess spike synchrony. And uh, just that you get an idea how this would typically be done to illustrate. So if I had, in the simplest case, these are simulated data, three neurons simultaneously recorded, one box is uh, one neuron over several trials, then you would typically unfold the individual trials that you have the neurons simultaneously, then you can detect for the coincidences, in this, in this case triplets, and if you found that these number of occurrences are larger than expected, then you would talk about unitary events. Typically, we do this analysis in a sliding window fashion in order to observe the dynamics of synchrony and to be able to relate this to behavior. Now, there, is, uh, there are some issues about violation of assumptions we do here, and I was basically working 10, 15 years to deal with this kind of issues. So, as you may know, firing rates of neurons are typically not stationary. They change as a function of time. And in the best case, they do it in the same way across the trials. Or the firing rates are different from trial to trial, non-stationarity across trials. Or the firing of the neurons deviates from a, 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 the a assumption of Poisson process. Um, if you neglect this assumption, if you actually neglect this, you typically show, uh, will get at some point, for here shown for non-stationarity across trials. So if, for example, the firing rate in different trials differs here from about 20, 40 to 50 spikes per second, you start to get false positives in completely independent data. So what we did we uh, looked uh, for the various cases and uh, tested when we get false positives and how we can avoid it. And typically, if you um, violate such assumptions, you typically affect the mean of the expected number of coincidences or the shape of the coincidence distribution. And as a, and as a consequence, you may reject the null hypothesis due to the wrong reason. And as a consequence, you would get false positives and, and or wrong interpretation of the data. For some of these aspects, there are analytical solutions available, but uh, often data are too complex. So what we uh, do instead, we use surrogates. So surrogates are artificial data which we generate from our data. Uh, where we manipulate, which we manip manipulate such that we destroy what we test for. So, in, for example, if you look, if you look for coincident spiking, you would intentionally destroy exactly this. Yeah. By, for example, this, a simple case would be to use trial shuffle because then you destroy the simultaneity of the recorded activity, or you could randomize the spike times or you could shift one spike train against the other, or you dither individual spikes by displacing it by a few number of milliseconds, and so on and so forth. So you see there are a number of um, surrogates on the market. Um, there is also here a small problem, because if you manipulate your data, you also dis destroy other features of the data, for example, the firing rates. So for example, such an extreme, it's, of course it's an extreme example, a rate step would be smoothed in some sense or the other. Or you would affect, you would affect the interspike interval distribution such that when you had preferred, a preferred interval that you would smooth it out and in the extreme case you get Poisson processes. So you need to be careful. 
Yeah? And you need just to, to test and calibrate method, which I typically do using simulated data where I have control over everything what is going to happen. And the, so, so what we do, we compare also different kind of surrogates. And as you can see that the coincidence distributions uh, um, uh, originating from such surrogates may be quite different and when, may also mislead you. So surrogates are good, but tr use them s carefully. That's the message. But we, we often do this. There is another issue then related to surrogates. Well, this is numerically um, expensive. And um, because in the, in, the, in the worst case, you do this in each sliding window separately, let's say 1,000 times to derive your coincidence distribution. You need to do this for each individual pattern. This is kind of expensive. But the people in our lab developed a nice, uh, easy way, which is described here in the chapter, in this chapter in the book Analysis of Parallel Spike Trains, which I edited two years ago, um, where you can parallelize, so to say, your your processes when they are independent from each other. So um, this helps also. So what you need to do is to bring this parallelization, to, for example, to distribute the processes on a cluster. Um, you can compile MATLAB code or better use Python in the directly. And what, what we do is simply make use of queuing systems and code generation for a easy parallelization. So this works quite well. So this problem is solved. Now let me show you some results, what kind of results we can get with such an analysis. One example which illustrates you also again the, the procedure, it's quite old. Um, so we, this is an example of two, experimentally, of two of the experimental data recorded in motor cortex from a wake behaving monkey. The monkey was involved in a delayed pointing task, he got at at this point in time, a preparatory signal was sitting still, and in this case, he got here a go signal to move his arm. Now, <clears throat> um, the, the monkey was trained to also have other waiting times, and these are these uh, lines you see here. So what we did is, in a time-resolved fashion, uh, analyze for empirical coincidence counts, as you can see in cyan, calculate the expectation, and at each uh, sliding window, we calculate the significance, which you can see here. And it can clearly be seen that at different instances in time, this is highly mod modulated, you see that there is excess spike synchrony occurring. Interestingly, at instances in time when the monkey expected the go signal to come. <coughs> now, we were, how do I go back? Um, we were a bit concerned at that time that this time interval of 300 milliseconds, which uh, appears here, is, so to say, leading to an internal clock, and that unitary synchrony is, so to say, occurring at this rhythm. Therefore, Alexa made then new experiments where she <coughs> trained the monkey for different timing intervals. So, and what you can see here is, so the monkey first was trained for a waiting period of 600 or 1200 milliseconds. And as we knew already in the, in the study before, unitary events occur at the 600 millisecond when he expected a signal to come, but did not come. Now she retrained the monkey not to wait 600 milliseconds, but 900 milliseconds and 1200 milliseconds. So in the first, in the first, um, uh, in the first sessions, the monkey was already able to do the new task, but unitary events still occurred at the old timing. But after some more practice, um, synchrony then occurred at the new timing. So meaning, the timing of the synchrony changes with practice. This is also, oops. Uh, this you can also see in the population of the data if we average over the first half of the sessions and the second half of the sessions, you see that this is a consistent result 
that when the monkey first was retrained, you don't see this excess synchrony, but after some time, you see that there is a excess synchrony at expected level. This correlates with behavior in the sense that, uh, that the reaction time of the monkey is actually going down uh, while he's improving his, his uh, performance. Now, coming back to the example I brought up in the very beginning, free viewing. This is an example from visual cortex. This was a collaboration with uh, Pedro Maldonado, who trained monkeys to do free viewing on natural scenes. And um, we actually looked for synchrony in this relation, and we found that when the monkeys were now starting to fixate here at this point in time, after some time, the firing rate increased and decayed slowly, but excess synchrony actually had a quite different um, temporal evolution. This was fast, very fast, about 50, 60 milliseconds after fixation onset and decayed fast. So we are able to, to extract this kind of dynamic uh, activity and find strong differences be fi between firing rates and, um, and synchrony. Now let me go, go on to uh, another aspect, which is massively parallel data. I mean, our results, I was quite excited about our results, and uh, we could say, yes, fine, but I am still concerned that we considerably undersample the system. Inserting five or maybe maximal or 10 electrodes is compared to 10 to the power of nine neurons, just nothing. And I wonder whether we actually oversee assembly activity a lot. Um, it's not a solution to do sequential recordings because you need simultaneous recordings from the neurons uh, to see their, their interaction and uh, their common activity. Also, just looking at signals summing over large populations would not help you to resolve, so to say, the microcircuits or the activity going on in, in the signal, in the, in the cortex. So what we choose to do is, on the one hand, um, observe population activity directly by looking at mesoscopic signals, like, for example, the local field potential, but relate them to elementary signals like the spikes and uh, corresponding processes. So just a comment, um, local field potential is a signal when you insert, when you have an intracellular, extracellular electrode in the brain, if you just low pass this, the signal about between, let's say, 1 and 500 hertz, you get the local field potential. If you high pass it above, let's say, 1,000 hertz, you would get the spiking activity. The other thing what you could do is directly observe many neurons simultaneously. And I will now talk briefly on the first and then quite longer on the second part. So the first approach to relate mesoscopic signals to spikes, we actually did this um, and we are interested in the relationship of the local field potential and uh, to the spiking activity. And we have quite a number of studies on this, but I just want to tell you briefly about the most exciting, I would say, where we looked at the relationship of synchrony to local field potential. I mean, everybody says, of course, local field potential, which has typically an oscillatory structure, is reflecting synchrony. But it, did anybody show? So what we did is we extracted first a different kind of spike events, like unitary events, just chance coincidences, and isolated spikes, which didn't f show a partner, and looked uh, at their relation to the local field potential. In the simplest case, just looking at the spike triggered average or coincidence triggered average or unitary event triggered average. And what you see is that um, the, the spike coincidence triggered average, if you relate it to unitary events, is much larger in amplitude than if you relate it to individual spikes or to chance coincidences. The, the reason for that is actually, so we went on and looked also 
um, whether this is a mere effect of the amplitude of the local field potential that this changes or whether this is rather a phase lock. It's a phase lock. The unitary events, the excess synchrony locks better to local field potential than chance coincidences. And actually this reminded me on the comment by uh, Carl Peterson because we were looking a lot on his papers whether, whether this uh, sub-threshold membrane potential uh, co-oscillation would actually lead to synchrony. No, it seems really that it needs uh, additional bumps. So the idea is that it's likely that the local field potential is also reflecting, so to say, larger oscillation of the system, but that assembly activity is just jumping from one bump to the other. And this is what we see here. Okay, but I would actually like to focus on this aspect. We will go on with this uh, local field potential relation to spiking activity with massively parallel spike trends as well. This is current work. Now I would like to tell you a little bit what we do in relation of observing many neurons simultaneously. And actually, um, there are no tools available, and we have to do that. So, and the motivation for something like this is to uncover correlation structure. This is a simulation, actually from the group of Markus Diesmann. And what you see here is these are many neurons simultaneously as a function of time. And what you, would, what you would conclude here if you look at this activity in the dot display is that, that the neurons coherently change their firing rates. But if you just resort the axis of the neuron IDs, you will notice that this is not a coherent change of firing rates, but actually there is propagating synchronous activity activity propagating through this network which appears as uh, increases of the firing rates. So we want to get at such a point that we are able to do this in data which we don't know the underlying structure. However, a simple extension of, of unitary event analysis to massively parallel spike trains leads just to a combinatorial explosion of parameters because to, to look for individual patterns in, let's say, 100 neurons, you would have to look for two, 10 to the power of 30 parameters, which is basically not possible. So we need to do something else, and this is what we did. We actually did a lot in this respect, and I would like to give you a, a, a bit of an idea how we try to approach this. Um, so first of all, we did in data a pairwise analysis. So this was data from cat visual cortex were recorded by a 10 by 10 electrode grid, MUA grid, and um, we restricted ourselves to the multi-unit activities, not to single units, and just looked at the pairwise cross-correlation. Here you can see an example, and evaluated whether this is a significant correlation by using surrogates and generated from these also the cross-correlations, and then we had quite a lot of significant pairwise correlations, which we then composed further by looking at um, overlapping clicks of uh, correlated neurons uh, at a graph and found, hmm, interesting, there is uh, actually, there is a, the, the whole data decomposed in, in four number of four clusters of highly intercorrelated neurons. So this was interesting, and we also found that this correlated to, or that these clusters occur uh, clustered in cortical space. But the question I was left with was, is this actually reflecting, is such a cluster reflecting the presence of higher order correlations? Meaning, do all the neurons in one of these clusters exhibit synchronous activity synchronously, or is this just a group which has pairwise or triplewise and so on? And this is a very complicated task. However, we started out with looking at a simple measure, which is the population histogram. So uh, consider you have 100 neurons simultaneously. This is again a simulation in which we uh, inserted a certain correlation structure, which you can see here as these coincident events, 
which you would hardly see if you look at randomized uh, neuron IDs. What you can just do is bin the data and look at the count across the neurons, meaning what we call complexity. Yeah? And you see here these high spikes of uh, reflecting coincident activity. And what you now can do is to use this mesh, this, all these counts, and generate a complexity distribution and compare it to a control situation where you don't have correlation in the data. And you see it's quite hard to see this little bit what is there in the tail. You see it with you if you, for example, um, make the difference of the two, but often it's just a, um, so to say, a distortion of, of the distribution. This you can then capture by uh, a method which we developed by looking at the measured coincidence distribution and deriving for this uh, distribution its moments. In this case, we use cum cumulants. And when you assume a certain type of model, in this case, a compound Poisson process model, where, where you can define the higher order structure, you can then relate these two, or actually you can from this distribution and its cumulants, actually only third order cumulants, derive the order of the correlation. So you can, so to say, derive a lower bound of higher order correlation, synchrony correlation. Well, but this was still a quite um, a simple model, which we assumed here. And we went on and said, OK, now we just assumed synchronous activity in this model. Let's go to maybe a more reasonable model which was suggested by Moshe Abeles many years ago, which is a synfire chain, which actually implements the <coughs> high convergence and divergence which we actually find in the cortex. And in the simplest case, this model would have groups of neurons. It's actually a feed-forward structure where you have a high divergence from the neurons of the first group to the other neurons and so on. And just given by this connectivity structure, um, you get the feature that if you stimulate the first group, that you get um, um, synchronous activity, which propagates through this network. OK, this is a very simple um, implementation. But what we did next was to embed this in a random balance network in which actually uh, all excitatory, two excitatory connections were replaced, so to say, or were then part of a synfire connectivity. The rest was as in a, in a randomly connected network. And then we looked at this activity. So um, in the first step, we did was what Abeles and Gerstein uh, suggested about 20 years ago or so, or 15 where they, they developed a spatial temporal pattern detector. And this is what we first applied on this data, meaning spatial temporal pattern, you have a spike. And then after some, some time, you get another spike in another neuron or the same. And then after yet another uh, some time, small time intervals, you get another pattern. And if such a pattern repeats at least twice, you would consider this. And this is the result of, of, of such the data I, uh, we generated with this embedded synfire chains. There were many synfire chains embedded. And we look at this uh, with a pattern spectrum, meaning what you see here is the complexity of the pattern, here the number of occurrences. And you see that even for very high complexity, many spikes involved, you get a high pattern count. Now, what you can do, just to give, give an idea whether this, is whether this is really significant or not, or just by chance, you can now, uh, again, do a surrogate, manipulate the individual spikes, for example, what we did here, a dithering of plus minus five milliseconds, and uh, all the high complex patterns with high counts just disappeared. Currently, we work on a significance evaluation that we can um, <coughs> indicate really which, which entries are significant and what not, which is, of course, not trivial because this is a multiple testing per se. Yeah? But um, um, if you are interested, there is a poster outside P117. 
you can get more details on that. Now, however we thought of doing a different analysis, actually we know that, that the synfile chain is a sequence of coincident activity. Now, if such a sequence of coincident activity, one particular synfile chain is active again, so we could actually imagine that we catch by binning the neurons active at this point in time when the first group is active and the first group when run again, you would have a high overlap of identical neurons being active. And the same holds for the second group. And so you can, so to say, build up an intersection matrix where you enter the intersection values at the times combined by the two instances you just combined. And then you would expect such a diagonal entry of high intersection values. Um, and actually, if you do this on this data, you get this. So here is now the analysis of the data I told you at the beginning. Um, you see these little diagonal stripes, which all reflect, so to say, the at least a repetition of one particular synfire activation. So this is good. So there are clear visual indications of synfire activity. And now we thought, what is the sensitivity of this? Can we actually now deal with 100 <coughs> neurons we have or 200 neurons we have currently at hand to apply this method? And actually, if you downsample this data from the simulation to 200 neurons, you, this would be the result of this, in, this analysis, which is now much more noisy, but you can help yourself by filtering this matrix by a diagonal filter, emphasizing this preferred um, stripey appearance. Uh, let's make a control. So now I show you again a pattern spectrum, however, of data in which the, the, the firing of the individual groups was randomized. And actually, um, if you apply now the, the intersection matrix analysis, you notice that, the, that actually these stripes are missing, these diagonal stripes are missing. Meaning, what I would strongly suggest is that we have data, and this is actually what we want to do in future, to, um, to use different analysis methods simultaneously on, this, on the same data in order to, so to say, uh, emphasize different aspects on the data, whether this is spatial temporal pattern or just coincidences and so on. So this is where we are. More, more or less in the moment, and I would like to come to an end and may come to the discussion. So um, I think I, am, I convinced you that correlation analysis for identification of interaction in the network is, is a reasonable approach. Unitary events indicate trans can indicate transiently active assemblies and that we can, should take care of avoiding false positives by incorporating statistical features of the neuronal data. Um, just a multiple pairwise analysis would not be enough to conclude on higher order correlations. And assembly, however, we expect or think that assembly activity is, is expressed by as higher order correlations. As I showed you, massively parallel spike data would lead to an explosion of parameters for individual patterns. But we now make use of um, population measures or integration over time and space, as we did with the intersection analysis. Analytical treatment is basically, I would say, impossible, given, given such complex data. And um, this is why we, why, why we make use of surrogates in order to, to deal with such data and to derive significance of the occurrences. And as I just said, in general, I would suggest to apply multiple analysis methods to the same data sets. Actually, we have now the chance to observe many neurons simultaneously. I am involved in two, uh, two big projects where we record on the one hand um, with two Utah arrays 
One in, uh, in motor cortex, the other in visual cortex, when the monkey is making a, a visual guide in motor task, this is together with Alexa Riele. In, uh, I have an electrophysiology lab at the CNIS. Uh, and the other project is, which we just started, actually a joint German-Japanese collaboration with Hiroshi Tamura and Shigeru Shinomoto, where we want to record multiple at multiple layers uh, of the visual pathway of a monkey doing um, a freely viewing task. So we will have this data, or actually we have already such data, and um, actually there are some issues to be solved. Um, <laughs> these data are a lot. These are huge data sets. Uh, so we actually need, uh, are currently de developing <coughs> strategies to deal with such huge data sets. Um, we have 500 gigabytes uh, approximately per day. Um, and actually, if you consider in addition pre-processing and so on, this um, is a lot to do. And actually also, how does do this data come from our experimenters to us, to Jülich, to analyze the data? So we are currently working on this. And in addition, something which probably sounds trivial to people from the neuroinformatics uh, environment or from people who do simulations. We are intensely working on developing workflows for, handling, uh, for the handling and analysis of such, such data. This is um, um, not trivial in particular if you have such massively parallel data, if you have a behaving monkey, if you have several trials, if you have several sessions over which you want to do this analysis, and in addition analysis which goes beyond just rate analysis, but looking at the correlation of this. And what you really want to aim at is to, to have a reproducible workflow where you just can change, for example, the bin width at the very beginning and then go through all the data sets again and get at the end without further intervention, get a, a figure for your paper. So, and this is what we want to aim at, and we do this together with uh, the G-Note, Thomas Wachtler, but also with Andrew Davison, and I want to refer to two posters, P113, Denker et al. on workflows, and P124 of the Electrophysiology Data Share Task Force, and I would like to thank you and uh, the people who work with me in Jülich and also other collaborators and the people who spend money for my work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. We have time for some questions. Mark. Can you say something about uh, the workflow engines that you're using and the extent to which they do provenance tracking? Well, um, this would be, we are trying to use uh, Sumatra, but we are not sure yet whether this would work for our applications. So of the com commonly available workflow engines, the one that has the most sophisticated uh, provenance tracking is actually Kepler. Yeah, so we also have this on our list to, to check. So we, we in the moment, are in our workflow somewhere up here, and uh, we, we want to check these various options. Do you use Kepler? Yes. Okay. We need to talk. Um, understanding question. On one of the earlier slides, you had uh, coincidences which were drifting and had sort of Curved lines. Could you explain again what that meant? Curved lines. I had curved lines. Do you mean? No, this? it was was a was a gray gray slide with about three or four curved lines, that, uh, inverted J's. This? No. Well, I could ask you afterwards. I think it was. Further. Ah. Was it a raster plot? And, and then another one which had some curve. Yeah. yeah, that's it, that's it. 
What, 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 is, what, is, it, what is happening there? It's just, just a raster plot with the uh, well, I just, I drifting just, slowly. I just reordered this, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, the neuronal ID, and what you see here is that you have propagation of synchronous activity through the network. This is one type of synfire chain, this is another one. And these are sequential in, see? These are spikes, synchronous spikes. It, it's a mm -hmm. bit compressed in time, but you see that 100 neurons are more or less synchronous than the next 100 and so on. Mm -hmm. This is what you see here. Are these um, sequential in time going up the graph, or is it uh, sort of? Yes, here is a time axis, look. It's going, it's going sideways, and the, and the mean. And this is a different group. And the chain idea is to, okay, I'll talk with you afterwards, thank you. Um, he asked me what if we have 10,000 neurons. Well, we train ourselves on, on, on simulation data, as you see here. These are, these are actually, these are 40,000. So, um, so this shouldn't be a big deal because we use, we use um, simple measures and then try to, to reduce, so to say, the complexity of the data until we have individual patterns and can these then relate to the dynamics and the behavior. 